won't they get tired of this? They worship so many goddesses like Kanchi Kamachi, Madure Meenachi, Kasi Visalachi, Nage Niladayachi. Uh, uh, then they commence with the silent guru, the chili powder guru, the grass meadow guru, the handful of earth eating guru, the pistachio eating guru, and the hands tied behind the back guru. Then they begin with a Sami, by which you mean Swami, for each city, worshipping them, giving them milk and fruits, offering them lentils and ghee, and also cannabis and opium, and standing with their arms folded. End quote. In Anadure's rendering, you have like an infestation, a guru for every use and locality. The drug to the eyeballs, swamis who keep people trapped in a religious fervor that renders them blind to their own pitiable state and to social inequalities. Yet his savage disavowal of them was precisely because such local and colorful figures, religious figures, had long been important in the Tamil landscape, both urban and rural. Their popularity had endured albeit within limited circles of devote disciples and through networks <laughs> and it had begun to proliferate particularly once print culture was established after the mid 19th century when the religious compositions of many of them could be printed and acquire circulation uh, not unusually as i'm going to also point out Many of them were distinctly subaltern figures from what can retrospectively now be called Dalit caste. The talk today is about one of these figures and what his life and work might tell us about how we are to conceive of the relationship of the Dalit caste to Tamil Shaivism into the long 19th century. Further, in thinking about this relationship, I also want to address and complicate the ways in which the relationship of Dalitness to Hinduism has now come to be understood. In doing so, finally, I hope to gesture towards how a historically nuanced understanding of this relationship might in turn help us achieve a clearer perspective on the contemporary moment, its understanding of Dal Dalit religiosity and the relationship between elite and non elite religion. So I'm going to the second slide and then uh, continue. Uh, this talk begins with an overview of a, the poetic composition of a man called Sivalingam, born in 1835 in the then town of Madras who passed away in 1900 and the single work of his available to us called the Purnanandodayam or the rising of complete bliss. Sometime after the 1870s, uh, due to the publication of this work and the emergence of a circle of small followers, Sivalingam came to be known as Sangasiddha Sivalinganayanar. I will lead us through a brief look into one important theologically pregnant section of this text called the Purnanando de Yamale or the garland of the rising of complete bliss or simply the garland. So it's a 40 verse subsection of the main text. I hope to elucidate how we might understand the garland as an Anubhuti text within the textual history of Tamil Shaivism. So I'm going to talk a bit about what does it mean to call a text an Anubhuti or experience text. In doing so, I will deal with the history of its composition, a history linked to the known biography and the self-referential information given within the text on the author and his placing of himself within the lineage of a 15th century Shaivite teacher called Kannudeya Vallal and his work, the Urivi Lodukkam, uh, which translates into absorption into the final state. So there's a very strong link established between the Purna and or the and the, the work from the 15th century. In the latter part of this talk, I will consider the history of the rediscovery 
of the Purnanandodayam in the 20th century and what this might tell us more broadly about subaltern religious assertion, its constitution of religious legitimacy and how a non-dualistically inclined strand of Tamil Shaivism formed a major strand of a non-elite Tamil religious tradition in colonial modernity. So as I said, uh, this uh, section, the garland uh, of 40 verses, forms a, you know, a, a coherent poetical unit in its own right. And I'm trying to see how I can go on to the next slide. Here we go, yes. Um, hmm. I'm sorry about that. Actually, yes. This is the ver uh, section I want to come to. So the garland begins with this one verse, which actually kind of encapsulates the whole poem. Uh, it condenses it. So I, I want to just begin with this. And the verse uh, in Tamil says, Arar arinda arivagum andri arut perar arinda per imayul orar or nithyame tanai nirind tame kandorgal pittarumai nipper pirind. And what does this verse mean? I've translated it. Not that the intelligence that knew the 36 tattvas are those who abide in the great light, the gift of grace. They saw themselves filled, they themselves permanent, and stood apart as the demented. So what does this verse mean? Uh, as I said, it lays out the themes of the entire poem and it sounds very enigmatic, but uh, I'm going to unpack it for you now. What it's saying is that a certain ultimate knowledge is achieved when one crosses and goes beyond the 36 tattvas, and I will go into what this means later and reaches the knowledge of oneself as filled eternally by a single permanent reality. This reality is a light that is full of grace. Those who abide in this state, which is also a state of bliss, are those who stand apart and will always be regarded by those who are without this experience as mad. Uh, this is the first verse. As we move down, uh, as we move into other verses, which I've not cited um, on the PowerPoint, we are, further, we are further told that the bliss seated in this shining space um, uh, is, uh, the space is one which is within oneself, um, but it is also uh, a space filled with the sacred syllable Om. Uh, the poem repeatedly plays with two motives that stress the paradoxical nature of the state of bliss. It is of the nature of a certain silence and the word mauna or monam in Tamil is used. And um, it is a silence that does not speak. And it is a nakedness, the word digambaram is used. It is a nakedness that completes one. So there is the use of a paradoxical imagery, a silence that does not speak and a nakedness that completes one. The nakedness or the stripping away of all the markers of social identity and retreating into silence enables one to reach this place of bliss. Uh, verse 23 says, without birth and death, without name and place, dying to forgetfulness and remembrance, that is the place of death called bliss. The attainment of this state of enlightenment is placed within an explicitly Shaiva framework. The poet tells us that one cannot know nor acquire this bliss without getting into a, a path through Shiva's initiation or a kind of Diksha, which is also described as an inner asceticism. Finally, the grace of Shiva and initiation that puts one on this path is only possible through the emergence of the guru within oneself as the silence that does not speak. Grace cannot be known in any other way except through the teacher or the guru within oneself who comes in his completeness 
into the inner place the moment one dies into the one reality then at that moment the inner guru um, becomes the guru within a state of extinction when we read the garland as it stands we might be disposed to think it speaks of a fairly straightforward mystical experience described by the author sangha siddha sivalinga nayana in a simple poetic diction there are certain puzzling bits in it about the tatvas etc but it does not seem to require any further contextualization and indeed it does not get such a contextualization in the edition that i used but its full significance can only be understood if we see its antecedents in other texts very similar to it uh, composed uh, between the 15th and the 19th century i call these texts the anubhuti texts or experiential texts of the main doctrinal school of tamil shaivism after the 14th century which is uh, the tamil shaiva siddhanta so uh, and here is a list of uh, some important anubhuti texts produced between the 15th and 19th centuries that i have studied but uh, there are many many more uh, which i still have to look at um I, I, you will be seeing you know the different coloring here um to put it very simply uh, the one the green coloring shows texts which veer towards a very strong non dualistic approach uh, then the red ones uh, are the ones composed um uh, by uh, veera shaiva authors and then you have uh, the purnanandodayam which is in blue below there so um you can see there's a steady production of these texts uh, and there are many more which i have not cited here because i have not you know studied them yet sufficiently to speak with a certain confidence on their contents um though i kind of looked at them uh, you can see uh, there is a steady production of these texts so what what do these anubhuti texts have in common as i said anubhuti is the direct experience of shiva they first started to emerge within the tamil shaiva siddhanta around the 15th century and a few centuries later around the 17th century in tamil veera shaivism um uh, very simply put the tamil shaiva siddhanta doctrinally adheres to a dual dualistic position when it comes to final liberation meaning uh, you cannot become shiva you are like shiva but you are not shiva uh the veera shaiva tradition in contrast uh adheres to a much more non dualistic approach because it's been heavily influenced by the pratyabhigna school of kashmiri shaivism and starts to produce very very interesting literature after the 17th century um uh in uh in the veera shaiva tradition uh the the so the final state of liberation is where you become a portion of shiva or an anga um uh, of him uh now uh basically in both the traditions though and this is very important to understand and there is tremendous overlap um in the tamil context because experientially uh the the this state of anubhuti uh is so much like a non dual state that it might as well be non dual in the sense that you feel so much like shiva that it doesn't really matter if you're not shiva or not i mean very very simply put and um the whole soteriological path the path to liberation in both traditions in the tamil country becomes the path of knowledge um the path of a certain kind of gnosis and this is because of the influence the very huge influence of advaita vedanta or non dualistic vedanta in the tamil country again after the 12th century uh, nevertheless in the current state of research on tamil shaivism uh, all these developments have been very little explored um, by and large um, uh, in in terms of a, a long duree perspective and this is what i'm trying to do in my work in the last decades uh now uh as i said uh the idea is to reach this state of anubhuti how does this state happen 
It happens through undertaking a process of involution within yourself. Now, this process is called by the text yoga, but the texts are very clear that this is not the classical yoga of Patanjali, the Ashtanga or the Eightfold Yoga, which is actually a lesser yogic path within these traditions. Instead, it is a Shiva Yoga, which means that you are going through a process of involution uh, of the basic categories of the Shaiva system um, uh, and the, the categories are the tattvas and uh, you, you go back in them until you finally reach Shiva and I'm going to just show you the categories briefly. So <laughs> you have uh, what's called the Shuddha Advan or the pure state before creation uh, where the highest uh, ontological category Shiva, Shakti, Sadashiva, Ishvara and Vidya. So the, uh, you know, they, they descend from Shiva onwards and that's the, the pure state or the Shuddha Advan. And then you have from category 31, you have the Ashuddha Advan or the impure creation, Maya, Kala and so on, right down to Prakriti or Pradhana. And then after Prakriti or Pradhana, you have the 23 evolutes which become the phenomenal world, which is very much part of the Sankhya school of thought. So in um, so broadly defined, the Anubhuti, in the Anubhuti work, what happens is a person goes and seeks out a guru who then initiates them and then leads them through this process of involution by which they absorb within themselves uh, the, the tattvas, they go up to prakriti, uh, they uh, absorb each lower one into the one above it until they reach a state of solitariness or kevala uh, within themselves. Uh, this is the point at which uh, the conceptual thought, I have known, comes to an end. In the Tamil Shaiva Siddhanta, <coughs> this state is where you reached Shakti, known as Parai in, uh, in the system. Parai meaning like is, is a shortened form of Para Shakti. Once the self crosses this Parai, there is the complete dissolution of I-ness, which is known as Tatbodham. One enters and mingles within Shiva in such a way that all traces of I-ness is destroyed. Um, and uh, uh, the Anubhuti texts, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of, as I said, uh, talk about an experiential oneness and uh, they are composed in both uh, uh, the more dualistic uh, Shaiva Siddhanta and in the less dualistic Veera Shaiva traditions. The state of liberation itself is called Orival, which means a dissolving, a final end or culmination. And very importantly, the person who has entered into this highest state experiences a living liberation. So they're a kind of a Jeevan Mukta, uh, which also frees them from normative social conventions, leading to a complete shedding of caste and kinship ties and the identity that comes from them and causing them to behave like those who are not responsible to the normative world. In other words, they behave like children, the mad, the possessed, who are disarming and spontaneous. Uh, now, uh, the work of uh, which I've just talked about, the garland, is explicitly uh, linked, uh, is, is such an Anubhuti text and charts exactly this path. But it also links itself explicitly to another Anubhuti text, uh, which is called the Orivilodukam, and for short form, I'll call it the Absorption, which was composed in the 15th century by a figure called Kanudeya Vallal. Um, before I come to that, let me just refer to uh, a little bit to the biography of uh, uh, Siddha Sivalinga Nayana, whom I'll just call Nayana. Um, how are we doing for time, Rohit? We are fine. I mean, we've just crossed 20 minutes. Yeah. Okay. 
Now, Nayanar was born as Sivalingam in 1835 in the vicinity of the city of Madras those days. The details of his parentage appear murky with a suggestion that the father was a Brahmin of the Adi Shaiva caste that traditionally functioned as priests in South Indian Shaiva temples. Uh, a hagiographical motive designed perhaps to con confer a certain religious legitimacy on him. The lowly origins of the mother are explicitly mentioned in contrast and appear to have determined uh, uh, the, the social status of the child whose life path subsequently does not include following in the profession of the father and becoming a kind of Shaiva priest, but instead uh, he works as a servant in the house of a British family in the city. Uh, the biography uh, speaks of an ardent young autodidact with religious inclinations who at the age of 16 already decided to seek out a guru. Uh, at some point, this boy stumbles upon the 15th century Anubhuti work, which I mentioned, the absorption, and starts to read it on his own. The biography speaks of his complete immersion in this work and his decision to accept the author of the work, who, mind you, uh, is long dead, obviously, um, the author of this work, Kanuri Avalil, as his guru. Through persistent reading and absorption in, the, in this work, uh, the, the author of the work, Kanuri Avalil, becomes Nayana's guru, and Nayana himself becomes enlightened and composes the garland. Thus, his religious trajectory is portrayed as that of someone who, due to his life circumstances, is, is, is an autodidact, to whom the text itself serves as the vehicle of enlightenment, and the deep immersion in which allowed Nayana uh, to internalize the text author as his guru. Now, the author, as I said, was Kanu Devalwal. Who is Kanodeya Valal? Well, I won't go into his long, uh, uh, you know, his biography, which is fascinating, uh, except to refer to a very important point. Kanodeya Valal himself wrote his work, The Absorption, on the basis that he had become enlightened by meditating upon and receiving in a vision uh, as his guru, the le legendary poet saint from the 9th and 10th centuries, uh, Tirinyana Sambandar, who's, part, uh, who's one of the main figures of the Shaiva devotional poetry. Uh, so the absorption is considered authoritative by later commentators on it because it is seen as revelation, uh, which was given by Tirinyana Sambandar to Kannudeya Vallal in a vision. But Tirinyana Sambandar, is no ordinary poet saint. Rather, by means of a sustained textual and hagiographical tradition, already by the 13th century, he had come to be seen as Shiva himself. And let me show how this works through the next slide. OK, lot of information, but please bear with me. So Tirunyana Samandar was born in Sirgari, modern day southwest Tamil Nadu, one of the three legendary founding figures of the devotional poetry of the Tamil Shaiva Siddhanta. Poetry comes to be compiled as part of the devotional poetical corpus, the Tirumurai, which is circa pre 12th century. Uh, you have a whole range of, of hagiographies, hagiographies of Tirunyana Sambandar, starting with the 12th century Periya Puranam, and then other ones. I won't go into them. I've just cited a few of uh, the hagiographical hymns about him. At some point, already by the 12th century, he is identified with Skanda or Murugan, uh, the son of Shiva. This is later imposed in an immensely popular poet, Arunagiri Nadar, in the 15th century. So Skanda or Murugan, or Kartikeya, as he's known in the Sanskritic literature, is identified with Shiva himself.
Svileta, can you hear us? Sridhar, can you hear us? Uh, we can't seem to get through to you. We might be having connectivity issues. maybe we can ask Professor Raman to uh, log back in again, log out and log yeah. back in. Oops. But, but I think she does, she's not realizing that she's not audible. Uh, can you just send her a quick message if it's possible? Yes, I'll do that. Yep. The only other way to is uh, to sort sure. of... Uh, maybe forcefully dismiss her, then she'll have to log back in. I think that works better. I mean, uh, because she's not realizing she's so I might, I think that might work better than the message. So yeah, I'll do that. If Stephanie is still around, maybe probably she can also uh, yeah, drop in a Stephanie, message. Uh, hi, if you have a Silata's number, would you be kind enough to sort of give her a call or maybe drop in a message? We are sending her a mail. I'm just, uh, I'm sure she has realized that she's not presenting anymore, so she'll just join. I'm just sending her a message.
so apologies to everyone still around maybe we can look wait for another 5 minutes and then uh, yeah maybe we can call it a day 5 more minutes it's 7 45 we can wait till 7:50 if that's fine with everyone and then we can call it a day
And I this mean, conference um, I, will I now had, be recorded. I had no idea that a figure like this existed uh, in, in the 19th century uh, Tamil Nadu. Um, I, I'm saying that because uh, when, when we when we do Dalit studies from the Ambedkarite prism, we see that the figure of the Dalit is largely uh, de-Hinduized, uh, even in the 21st century. So it's, it's very interesting to come across a figure like this who is in the thick and like you know of of not just Hinduism but a very specific sect, uh, Shaivism. So thank you for introducing this figure, and it, it gives, definitely uh, makes me. Um, understand Tamil Nadu politics, especially of the 20th century, in a, in a certain. Uh, uh, I had two very basic questions. You know, uh, the yes. one question. I mean, uh, when I was preparing to attend your conversation, I did a little bit of Google search on this figure, and I came across this website, which is uh, which has been devoted of to to Siddha uh, Shivalinga Nayanar, and the yes. brief brief biography says that. Uh, his grandfather, it seems, worked in a Shiva temple in in 19th century, and his yes, father, yes. yeah, his father had uh, like you know, access to Sanskrit literature, and he uh, uh, went on to become a expert in Vedic literature. My main, very basic curiosity is uh, how did this happen? Because um, our sense is that historically. Dalits were not allowed to enter temples and they had no access to Sanskrit Vedic religious literature. So if you can like, you know, give me some basic information from his biography, from his life, that how this was happening. The yes. second question is more contemporary. Um, I mean, we, we know like you know, how um, the politics in South India is turning uh, in, in past maybe 10, 12 years. And there is a contemporary. So have you come across any uh, attempt by the contemporary political groups, specific kind of political groups, groups in contemporary Tamil Nadu, who are trying to revive such figures. I mean, we know what is happening in Karnataka. We also see some sort of an attempt in Tamil Nadu. Uh, is there a contemporary revival of Nayanar, uh, um, Siddha Sivalinga Nayanar, uh, from a specific political uh, group, you know, to get some political scores? I hope you get my uh, question. I, I totally, I totally get your point. Yeah. Okay. It, yeah, are, that's that, that's also my side. Yeah. Well, these are these are questions which sort of actually really require like a uh, a one day you and me sitting together and, and talking at great length because uh, in some ways the, the, these are questions that go into um, you know a much a, a, a much bigger issue of of uh, Tamil religious historiography. Um, the relationship between that and, and, and Dravidian political mobilization and so on, right? Which I, which uh, is the point. I, I will just try and address it briefly, though. But uh, at the risk of sounding really obnoxious, my I'll have to say, so I just look at my new book, which is sort of addressing a lot of these issues, and from which the the. Uh, this talk actually is is a kind of almost natural evolution as well. Uh, the fact is, you say okay. So my first point is, of course, the 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 nineteenth century is particularly seeing the emergence of these figures because of spaces, create, colonial spaces, which have been created for uh, for a certain kind of assertion. And people who are working in Dalit studies have talked about, um, you know. Uh, Dalit self-fashioning and colonialism, which enables certain things to happen. Um, but what is less known, because um, of, in a way, the the accentuation on the colonial moment, is uh, the the period leading up to it in the 17th and 18th centuries, and and the time even before that. And why is this less known? Uh, in terms of uh, these figures, even within Tamil religious historiography or even in the contemporary moment. Of course, these figures have never been forgotten in very, very local ways. Mm -hmm. Like in Chintadri Pet, uh, you will have memories, you'll have a Sama, you know, of, of one of these figures, Isu Sachinat Swami. You'll have the Samadhi, you'll have a little temple, you'll have local worship, but nothing beyond that. And the work may not even be read beyond like five people. Why is that? The answer is very, very simple. Uh, these are not easy works to read. 
uh, they uh, they cannot be understood unless you understand first of all uh, pre-modern Tamil poetry and un unless I mean understand fully uh, and cannot be understood unless you know the evolution of the theology in Shaivism in these periods. So it's not as if you can just go and, and you know read them and, and just get what's going on. Um, and secondly, uh, the mobilization of these figures in contemporary Tamil Nadu, I mean, first of all, for that reason is difficult. The second reason is because uh, post Anadure, and Anadure I gave us, uh, the reason I spoke of Anadure is for that reason, um, but in the colonial period, what is happening is really that Dravidian nationalism needs to break radically with the religious past, uh, dismiss it as, uh, you know, problematic and decadent, which in some ways, I mean, they were not wrong, in order to forge forward with an extremely uh, uh, effective caste critique, right, and effective radicalism, um, mm. and seeing the traditional monastic institutions as, as sort of caste-ridden was part of that uh, part of that hermeneutical move, uh, which mm. was very effective, mm. right? So, how are you going to make space for this again? Uh, is mm. going to be interesting. Um, I think it won't be easy. Uh, unless uh, you you see that these figures were also cast critical in fundamental ways. Um, mm. So uh, when and how is that going to happen? Uh, it's hard to say, but uh, mm. it could happen in the current uh, in the current moment. I don't know. If, I haven't answered all the question comprehensively, but I've made a stab at it. Thank you. It makes sense, and I definitely will look into your book. Yeah, uh, only because I've answered it at much greater and, and much more, uh, you know, uh, in, in nuanced length uh, in the book, not for any other reason. Yes, yes, sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Himanshu, would you want to unmute yourself and switch on your camera? You have the question next. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Raman, for this fascinating talk. You know, my question would come from the plane of ignorance. People can call me Sri Lata. It's okay. I'm, I'm, okay. It's fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, my question would actually um, emerge from the plane of ignorance because I don't know anything about the field, but I'm just curious that this whole concept of Anubhuti, uh, which is kind of sort of self-realization, uh, can, you know, transcends this, uh, you know, um, notion of looking at objects but looking inwards uh, and can it then you know so and then it also acts like a conduit between atma and parmatma right it's like the self-realization which you yourself said leads to moksha you know how does that play into the politics of you know the the religion theology caste all put in because you know the basic premise is the same the core is the same uh, and the second is, you know, we come across, uh, you know, I kind of uh, come across uh, approach Anubhuti by Shankar Acharya. You know, is the, what, what is, how is it different from that? Uh, uh, so, well, so yeah. what's the politics there? I'm a political scientist, but I'm always looking for some kind of, <laughs> you know, a churning, which probably this uh, uh, might. Yeah. Be. Thanks. No, uh, nice. Well, firstly, Anubhuti and caste. I think the point I mentioned is very early on that uh, moment you achieve Anubhuti, you're a liberated soul in this life and you are a Shiva Yogi. And a Shiva Yogi is actually described as a child or a madman because the Shiva Yogi is not understood by the, norm the, the normative conventions of society and has chosen to stand outside it. It's very important to understand this idea of the anarchic, the spontaneous Shiva Yogi does not come <coughs> only from 15th century onwards, which is what this talk does, but goes back to a much older strain of uh, uh, Shaivism in 
the whole of south india starting with uh with uh, uh you know uh, uh what are called the shiva dharma texts it goes back it's much much older but uh it in this it is in the idea of the shiva yogi that the seeds of even uh veera shaiva radicalism which are later comes out in the vachanakaras or the radicalism of even this sort of dalit figure so called dalit figures being able to partake of it that's where it comes from so lesha uh, you know it has a very long genealogy uh, in in the, in uh, in uh, the history of shaivism it, one has to understand <coughs> that in terms of shankara advaita uh, there is again a very long history but if you take and if you restrict yourself to shankara but even to his later you know to sureshwara mandana mishra whatever the uh, you know you you first of all you have to go through vedic study you cannot achieve a certain state of jnana without a vedic study vedic study is the prerogative only of the twice born or the dvijas i mean shankara's brahma sutra bhashya is other, there are these are all clear indications of this but once you achieve that you know once you go through vedic study then it's like uh, a parokshanubhuti happens when you make the leap into a certain kind of gnostic insight once that happens the karma kanda doesn't matter none of the rituals of a brahmanical identity or any of the caste identity matter anymore but it's a ladder and then at some point you kick the ladder off and you're in a different state and then the ladder doesn't the, the conventions don't apply to you any right but it, they do apply at the level of uh, you know at the level of mundane reality i mean i think this has to be understood what is done with shankara in what you would call modern vedanta through people like swami vivekananda and a whole range of other figures uh, swami ramatirtha is something different or radha krishna you know they are taking this into into uh, into making and making it into something fairly you know radical or whatever in in a certain sense of course it's it's, it's not radical in other senses at all but there is a big difference between the idea of shiva yoga which is based on uh, you know a certain shaivite absorption uh, going to anubhuti and the shiva yogi as outside a uh, because the shiva yogi and that's the point the shiva yogi need not begin as a brahmin or a dvija or twice born uh, of any kind the shiva yogi only needs shaiva diksha it's a so it's it's a different system you know you don't have to so it becomes more it has a certain emancipatory potential at the level of caste in terms of a a a, a salvic big process which uh, uh which uh, advaita vedanta doesn't offer uh in the pre modern context thanks thank you that... no no thanks i learned a lot <laughs> uh from your response thank you uh thank you manshu uh silata i have a question and i think that's the final question that we have so when i was reading up on nayanar uh, i couldn't help but notice the sort of similarities with one of his near contemporaries ramkrishna paramahansa and uh, ramkrishna i mean is born one year after but yes. uh, this this he's a similarly a seeker in nayanar i mean the search for the atma gyana takes him you know to a text i mean if i'm not mistaken vallalas or ever lodukum and from experiential there is that textual knowledge uh, nayanar's father has was also a shastri and all of that uh, I mean I from your talk I get the sense that there is a longer of course this is because his search leads him to the text because there is a longer genealogy of Tamil textualism there is of course the Anubhuti text uh and all of that but I was wondering besides of course the search for textualism another seeker in the text could this uniqueness because Ramakrishna Paramahansa is always talking about experiential knowledge he is almost an anti textualist in that sense 
despite sort of being a near contemporary with Nayanar. Right. And, right. Similar, and there are similar things happening in Bengal and Tamil Nadu at this point, right? Right. But here is one person like Ram Krishna who sort of uh, the middle classes find fascinating. He takes the city by storm, but he's an anti-textualist. And yet here is Nayanar, who is part of that longer textualist tradition. I'm sure one way to explain this is through that longer genealogy of Anubhuti text. But I was just wondering, I might be completely off here, but is can this also be explained through the, you know, the Tamil Appadu that's coming up around this time, the idea of the Nadu, the idea of the longer classicism in Tamil text and longer idea of a Tamil land, if you will, that familiar language, the familiar identity, which is very different from the Bharata Desa. Bengal, of course, is still trapped in that idea of the Bharata Desa, the Bharat Mata. But right. the idea of the Tamil Appadu, that, that Tamil Nadu, is, is conceptualized differently from that idea of a desa. So could that also have something to do with why he seeks, but then finds, you know, his, his Brahman in that text of Vallala and not, you know, purely experiential knowledge. He doesn't become a Ramakrishna Paramahansa and an anti-textualist. That's a lovely, yeah. So let me explain by saying that uh, the, the figure on which my monograph was written, uh, Vallalar, uh, Ramalinga Swamigal, actually would very much fit into what you're talking about, the Tamil, hmm. and, and actually thematizes it explicitly that, you know, drawing the resource for a certain caste critique, soteriological experience from, uh, from the conception of Tamil, which again, of course, is extremely old. It goes back to the Tulhapyam, where the boundaries of the of the Tamil country are mentioned and then picked up with Dravidian nationalism. Um, but I think also, uh, uh, so, but with Naina, one's not seeing an emphasis on Tamil as such. I mean, we mustn't forget we only have one text that is the Purnananda. He didn't write anything else that we have available to us. And this was the only thing, one which is preserved. So there is, uh, you know, there is uh, less. It's not about Tamil so much as it is about uh, if, we're, if one is talking about community, one's really talking about that which is created through Ghana. And Ghana is bringing together Tamil Sufism, uh, you know, uh, Tamil Shaivism and a lot of fascinating spaces, you know, Siddha stuff in between um, in the space of uh, the liminal space of, you know, um, the graveyard, the cemetery, uh, you know, and so on, right? So that's where community is happening. It's not the idea of the Tamil, which is, which has, by the way, always been an elite production within, yeah. uh, within the Tamil country, uh, uh, you know, uh, going back to much older times. But um, there was something else I wanted to say to this. Uh, because it also ties in with, with Sudha's question, which is, and uh, what I want to stress is orality. Now, the significance of, I mean, uh, um, the, the great Tamil scholar Kamal Srelibal rightly pointed out that the genius of Tamil literature lies in the single verse, right? Mm. Uh, the, the single verse and in orality. So throughout the history of Tamil uh, Shaivism or Tamil Vaishnavism or any of these traditions, uh, it is not, I mean, of course, there are cases where a, a, a writer's entire work, uh, a, a composer's entire work is known, but much, but that's very rare. If you take any of uh, uh, Tamil religious literature or non-religious, what is known are individual verses and what is uh, remembered and recited over centuries are individual verses. So in some way, the poet, you know, poetry and orality are uh, even more than textuality is what is leading figures like Nayanar and uh, to compose certain works because they are absorbing this through uh, 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 an old style, uh, what's called PR school education, through uh, uh, through uh, uh, oral uh, uh, techniques of recitation and learning uh, as part of their own curriculum uh, from which they're able to do this. Right. right. So uh, literacy is oral literacy uh, very often.
Uh, I, I mean, uh, no, it's not oral literacy, but the orality is a huge component of it. And you've had this continue, you know, you've had this continuously. Right. Thank you, Silata. We have, we do have one more question, Silata, if it's fine. Uh, we have Lokesh with us. Lokesh, will you unmute, unmute yourself and uh, switch on your camera? And maybe just introduce yourself in one line? If it's fine. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Yeah, I'm yes. not sure I whether I'm visible. Also. I yeah, hi. Uh, so, yeah, thank you so much for the this beautiful lecture that you delivered. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to ask my question. So, uh, like from the last to last, like uh, the question before this, you made a remark that Shiva Yoga is sort of minimal in its requirement, right? That it sort of also allows uh, other castes to also get initiated, right? If I'm not wrong about that Shiva Yoga thing. I yeah, think this is the well, observation. I wouldn't, that call it, I wouldn't call it minimal in its, it's minimal in its caste requirement. Yes, exactly. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so actually, um, I wanted to add something and I just want your opinion on this. Uh, so uh, Shiva as uh, like in uh, Indian philosophical tradition, he is considered to be the controller of the mode of ignorance, which is called the Tamu Guna. Yes. Right. So, yeah. So, uh, so I think it's not only about uh, the lower Varnas, the lower so-called lower Varnas, uh, but rather other Varnas also. So, like if we go to the Chandalas, which who are not included in the four uh, Varnas also. They also sort of worship uh, Shiva, right? And uh, so I just want an opinion on that, this part. And uh, the other one would be the other question is, uh, so also uh, we have this uh, sort of inclusive uh, uh, yoga system practice in Vaishnav culture also. And you must have explored, uh, I, I was seeing the your profile also, you have uh, explored quite a lot in uh, Sri Vaishnavism culture also. Uh, but I would like to uh, point out to the Vaishnava culture of the Gaudiya tradition. We had like lot of uh, gurus who were from uh, uh, not Brahminical uh, in their uh, caste, but they were Kayast and uh, even uh, Muslims and uh, Shudras also. They were also gurus. So I just want you to comment on uh, the inclusiveness of this one also. Like, would you consider Sri Vaishnavism at par with? Uh, uh, the Shaiva, the Naina tradition that you pointed out in terms of uh, how uh, inclusive uh, it is uh, to uh, include people in the yoga system of it, their yoga system. Yeah, thank you, Lokesh. Now, the yoga system, I mean, uh, of Sri Vaishnavism, I think is accepted by the tradition itself to have been lost. The, the yoga system um, and in, in, the, in the systems, in Sri Vaishnavism's own historiography, it gets lost by the time of the 12th century because uh, the, the first Acharya Natha Muni is supposed to have written a work, the Yoga Rahasya, which is lost. So in some sense, the Sri Vaishnava tradition admits openly to have lost its own yoga system. And instead, of course, it develops um, it uh, it develops, uh, you know, the whole idea of Bhakti Yoga from the Bhagavad Gita, but it does not develop, but the Bhakti Yoga is not linked to any kind of Ashtanga Yoga kind of process within the works of the Acharyas. It is, of course, takes the direction of um, Dhyana, right? But then that becomes, uh, it moves into the kind of ritual of self-surrender or prapati. So there's a development which is not about any kind of yogic practice as such. Uh, of course, Ramanuja says uh, the famous definition of dhyana in the Sri Vashya is dhyanam hi tailadara with avichinna spriti santana rupam. So dhyana is constant steady remembrance like a stream of oil on uh, Vasudeva or Narayana, but there is no technique which is being talked about it's 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 only it's only about you know permanent contemplation uh, that's but what you're having in the uh, in the shaiva tradition the tamil shaiva is actually being led to a process of uh, of the tattvas 
into a reabsorption uh, in a Shiva Yoga. So the, the Shaiva tradition in the, in the Tamil context after the 15th century maintains an active uh, account of a yoga practice, which is lost in the Vaishnava tradition. Okay, which doesn't exist in that form in the Sri Vaishnava tradition. As for worship of Shiva, of course, of course, you are having all kinds of worship of Shiva going on at the same time. And of course, in the, in the Periya Purana was talking about devotional acts, piety, Maheshwara Puja, where you feed Shaiva devotees. It's itself a form of worship, etc. It's worship of the goddess takes on various folk forms as well. But the Anubhuti texts are not uh, that kind of, uh, you know, popular practice. They are not easy to read. They are technically accomplished. They are, they are actually a whole tradition which is of a, of a high literature, but is now being composed also by those of, a, of technically a very a low caste. That is, uh, that, that is, I, I mean, it's a, it's a different strand of Shaivism, right? <laughs> but I just want to come back uh, to Sudha when you said, you know, it's kind of weird that, I mean, I looked in, you said, I looked into his website. I saw that it said his, his grandfather was a, a learned Shastri. Well, I, I'm not entirely sure to what extent uh, this uh, this is a hagiographical validation uh, and how much of it is actually uh, based on historical fact. I, I mean, I'm open to, uh, to uh, you know, to thinking about this because other figures who compose these kind of t texts do not have uh, that necessarily that kind of uh, hagiographical uh, validation they are actually autodidacts. And, and, and what is interesting is Nayana never, I mean, for Nayana to be working, you know, as a servant in a British household, uh, thereby breaking all caste barriers, I think is a very interesting fact that needs to be taken into account. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, that's, I don't know, Lokesh, if I, if that is, yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, so I don't know uh, how much time do we have, uh, but I just uh, wanted to uh, ask you about the uh, Gaudiya Vaishnav tradition. So um, I don't know whether you have uh, uh, explored that area also. Uh, no, no, I have not, except in a very minimal general history of uh, uh, sort of Vaishnavism way. I've got to confess that you probably know 500 times more than I do about uh, you know, the Gaudiya, uh, particularly the social history of the Gaudiya tradition, I, mm -hmm. I can claim to be fairly ignorant. No, but that was sort of very informative for me. Like I uh, got the big, bigger picture of the bigger project that uh, you are doing. The Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lokesh, and thank you, Silata, for taking time out for this. We had a lovely uh, and engaging conversation. And thank you to everybody who's still with us. Uh, thank you, Atri, for that timely advice. And uh, maybe uh, we can host you sometime in Dehradun since you have not seen Dehradun. So, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rohit and Himanshu, and all of you for taking the time uh, very late in the evening to attend this talk. Yeah. And it's been a great pleasure. And I hope to. I'm going to, you know, hope to look at look up all your work and, and learn more as well myself. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Siddhartha. We'll come oh, tonight. Bye. Good morning to you there. Bye. Bye-bye.